But when someone dismisses something because it's quote unquote improbable, it's not simply a probabilistic argument. There's also a value judgment there. And the reason is when I'm driving along a country road and there's a hill, I can't see the cars that are coming up. And let's say I've passed 50 of them and there's no cars, it's empty. I still slow down at the top of the hill, even though it's improbable there's another car because it's important that I don't hit someone or that I don't get hit. And so even if it's improbable that it's life, the importance of it is so high that that needs to be taken into account as well. Exactly, exactly. That was uh, Pascal Blaise Pascal's uh, argument why we should discuss uh, the possibility of God because the implications are so great. Um, and my point uh, in response to Carl Sagan's quote is that extraordinary evidence requires extraordinary funding. And, uh, you know, we invested billions of dollars in the search for dark matter over the past uh, several decades. The most, the most recent attempt was using the Large Hadron Collider that cost $10 billion to find the lightest supersymmetric particle as a candidate for the dark matter. And people said, you know, it will be found, it's around the corner. Uh, string theory was established on the foundation of supersymmetry. And there are some very natural set of parameters for supersymmetry that everyone believed in. And awards were given to people who suggested that and so forth. And then the Large Hadron Collider at the cost of $10 billion didn't find it. Okay, there is no uh, supersymmetry at the natural set of parameters, there was no dark matter particle that we discovered so far, okay? And I, so I say, you know, if we were to invest billions of dollars in the search for equipment from other civilizations in outer space, and we would spend billions of dollars for decades and not find anything, then we would be exactly at the same point as dark matter searches are right now. So why didn't anyone say supersymmetry is an extraordinary claim? There is no extraordinary evidence for it. Therefore, we should not fund the search. Why didn't anyone say, no, it's legitimate to search for supersymmetry because there was a community that agreed that it's a good idea. Okay, so we invested the billions of dollars. We didn't find it. Does anyone take responsibility for that? No, people say, well, that's the nature of science. You imagine something, you don't find it. So now, why do we block funding for something that we as a civilization already did in terms of sending equipment uh, out of the solar system? Why do we block fu funding for the search for something similar that was initiated by a duplicate of ourselves? Because, you know, the, the dice was rolled tens of billions of times in the Milky Way galaxy, the dice of intelligence. We know that somewhere between a few percent to a hundred percent of all the sun-like stars have a planet the size of the Earth, roughly the same separation. That's from the Kepler satellite. We already know that. So what we find in the solar system is not an extremely rare situation. And I say, okay, you roll the dice of intelligence so many times, tens of billions, it's quite possible. And most stars, from billions of years before the sun, we should allow for this possibility. To me, it doesn't sound more far-fetched or more speculative than the lightest supersymmetric particle being the dark matter, okay? But on that front, we invested billions of dollars uh, in the search for the lightest supersymmetric particle. On the front of searching for what we are doing from another kid on our cosmic block, we didn't spend anything from federal funding. So the Galileo project is funded by private donations. And we haven't really engaged scientifically in that search. So I say there is a mismatch between the current academic approach to this subject. And moreover, you may say, oh, um, scientists are conservative. I say, how, it, how is that possible? to imagine that scientists are conservative because you have a whole community of theoretical physicists that for four decades are working on extra dimensions, on the multiverse, on string theory, ideas that have no foundation in experimental verification. There is no evidence for those ideas, yet they are part of the mainstream. And on the other hand, we have some evidence that we exist as an intelligent species, we have evidence that we send out equipment that will exit the solar system. We have evidence that 
A planet like the Earth around a star like the Sun is very common. You know, it's there are billions, if not tens of billions of such planets in the Milky Way galaxy alone. And many of these stars from billions of years before the Sun. So how can we even argue that this is a very speculative idea to imagine that we are not, that Albert Einstein was not the smartest scientist that ever existed since the Big Bang. I mean, that makes no sense. It's very likely that there was a scientist smarter than Albert Einstein that lived a billion years ago on an exoplanet. And the civilization who benefited from the discoveries of that scientist may have sent probes that fill up the Milky Way galaxy and may populate the habitable zones of many stars by now. Furthermore, there's the simulation hypothesis which presupposes something like another intelligent life. Why is it that certain mainstream ideas, like you mentioned, extra dimensions and <clears throat> many worlds and even simulation and so on, is the, simulation is more philosophical than it is physics-based, but why is it that these ideas are taken more seriously? However, the ideas that there's extraterrestrial intelligent life that has visited us, whether or not it exists, I think main, many or perhaps most scientists would say yes. But whether or not they've visited us or continue to visit us to this day is something different. Why do you think that is? Why do you think oh. that they don't like that idea? It's clearly because there's a stigma. So why, why is that stigma there? Yeah, it's, it, it, this, the answer is very simple. Humans enjoy ideas that flatter their ego. Okay, so if the idea says... We are at the center of the universe. That's great. We can adapt it for a thousand years. We can put Galileo in house arrest and refuse to look at the evidence. Why? Because it flatters our ego to think that we are at the center of the universe, that God considers us special, unique, and privileged. Okay, so then... You find evidence. After a while, even though you lock Galileo, eventually it turns out that we are not at the center of the universe. Eventually it turns out that we came to the cosmic stage just at the end. So if you come to a play, you know, 13.8 billion years after the cosmic play started, just at the end, and you are not at the center of the stage, then guess what? You are not a primary actor. Okay, and you better search for other actors to tell you what the play is about. Okay, but that goes against the human ego. That's not flattering. So what do you do? You say, okay, I'm not at the center of the play, but there are no other actors. Therefore, I am important despite everything. And I am the smartest. Now, I can understand that approach because when my daughters were young, they were at home. And they thought that they are the smartest in the world until we took them to the kindergarten. And on the first day in the kindergarten, they had a psychological shock to realize that there is a smarter kid in their neighborhood. Now, I say, how can you avoid going to the kindergarten? Very easily. You just ridicule on social media any possible intriguing evidence that that's not the case. The way the, way the philosophers behaved at the time of Galileo, you hope that nobody else will pay attention to Galileo. Why? Because you put him in house arrest so that nobody can listen. You don't look through the telescope and you suppress the information as much as you can. And you say, there is nothing there. Forget about it. Exclamation mark, period. Forget about it. You say that, you put him in house arrest so nobody would listen. You think that would cure uh, the threat to your ego. But it doesn't because eventually someone else finds the evidence. And reality is whatever it is. If you were to ask those philosophers to design a space mission that would reach Mars, they would never get to their destination because they thought that Mars moves around the Earth. But reality is not like that. You know, you can launch a spacecraft and it will never reach the destination if you have the wrong ideas. So by today's standards, what Galileo said was trivial because you can look at the Earth from a distance, you can go to Mars, and you realize Galileo was right. Okay, there is no way these philosophers were right. You know that. Okay, but for a while, they were able to dominate public opinion, to be popular, and to maintain their grip on the false notion of reality. So that's, that's a tendency, that's a, a, the ability of humans to 
basically go on Twitter and make a lot of noise about something that they don't like. Now, it may work in politics. You know, in politics, things are, you know, you don't have hard facts sometimes. So you can argue whatever you want. You can get a lot of likes and you feel good about yourself. But in science, what Galileo taught us is if you want to adapt to reality, you better pay attention to evidence. So I say when there is something intriguing that doesn't line up with what you expected, the, your duty as a scientist is to collect more evidence. Your duty is to say, well, maybe the emperor has no clothes. Maybe what we think is incorrect. And the only way to find out is to admit that possibility, to admit the possibility that the dark matter may not be weakly interacting massive particle, because if you do find the Large Hadron Collider and it doesn't find it, you know that your previous notion was incorrect. That's the way science makes progress. It checks possibilities by looking for evidence. And if you, on the other hand, say you know the answer in advance, you may be just like those philosophers. Just to give you an example, this expedition to Papua New Guinea gained a lot of traction recently because the NBC had a beautiful video about it. Uh, and the NPR reported about it. And then as soon as the NPR story broke out, just yesterday it broke out for the second time, some people had negative things. They injected poison into the discussion by saying... Some people? Ah, yeah, some people. And many of them are not practicing astronomers. Um, and so I, I don't want even to get into the issue of what their qualifications are. Uh, but the point of the matter is, you know, this expedition is funded from donations. It's done by a team of scientists. And all we are doing is going to a place where a meteor disintegrated and trying to check what the fragments are made of. Like, why would that bother anyone? Why would anyone resist that other than the instinct that the philosophers had at the time of Galileo. What I'm trying to say is four centuries later, we still see the same phenomenon where people with very strong conviction oppose the gathering of evidence and data. And why am, are we going to Papua New Guinea? Why? Because this object was tougher than iron. There is evidence for that because the government measured the properties of the meteor, and it looks like it came from outside the solar system, so it was an outlier. That's all. So it's all guided. You know, I didn't dream this object at night. It was not a subject of a science fiction story. It was evidence the government provided that allows you, using the laws of physics, to figure out that this is an outlier, okay, that came from outside the solar system. That's all. It motivates us to examine what its composition is. So why wouldn't everyone cheer up and say, great, let's figure out what this object is. Let's find more evidence. Why would it bother people that this is happening? And the only way I can see it is first, jealousy that this project gets attention, okay? So whenever there is a flower blooming above the grass level, people try to step on the flower because it bothers them that there is something different rising above the grass level. They would rather see only grass. Okay, so that's one tendency that out of jealousy, they don't like the fact that there is a, a flower blooming above the grass level. Okay, so whenever there is a flower, they would step on it. So that's mm -hmm. a reason for toxicity, you know, like in social media. But a second thing is prejudice. And we don't, you know, people find it uh, offending, offensive to consider the possibility that we are not the smartest kid on the cosmic block. It really bothers people because... You know, just imagine that. Imagine that we see the 100th version of the iPhone coming from space. And it does magic. Sort of like a cave dweller finding a cell phone or going to New York City and seeing all the gadgets there. The cave dweller would never be able to reverse engineer these things. It would look like magic but it would be a blow to the ego of the cave dweller who is used to hunting animals or playing with rocks. So obviously, if the cave dweller finds a cell phone, the first impression would be, oh, it's a rock of a type that I've never seen before. Okay, just like Oumuamua is a rock of a type that we've never seen before. So that's the first impression because you're used to a vocabulary that, you know, you play with rocks all your life. This is a rock of a type that I've never seen before. 
But then you start realizing that this gadget does things that a rock doesn't. Like if you press a button, it records your voice or records your image. So then it will change your perception. And eventually you would realize there is magic here. That something that goes beyond what I was able to accomplish in my life of hunting and gathering. Okay. So the cave dweller will realize that. And for us, the way to realize it is that we will figure out that something is not natural. Doesn't look like the composition of a natural object. Or that it behaves in ways that go beyond our technologies. Okay. So I say we can follow the same learning exercise. We can, by getting more evidence, we can get out of our comfort zone. But most people prefer to stay in their comfort zone, just like the philosophers prefer to stay in their comfort zone of us being at the center of the world. I see those as the same. The first one, which is the flower that stands above the grass and wanting to stomp it out out of jealousy. And then the second one out of wanting to be the most brightest kid on the block. Because both point out one's own insufficiencies, as far as one thinks that it's, all, it's almost a view of oneself. If I was to correct, or if one was to correct, although I'm speaking to myself, my own insecurities and my own lowly view of myself, then I wouldn't be so quick to criticize others. And also maybe see that something else being more valuable means that I can use that as an aim, so I can see it as a positive rather than a a detriment, that it doesn't shine such a negative light on me or shine no light because all the spotlight is elsewhere. Yeah, there is, a, there is a simple remedy to that. And let me just mention, what is the solution? The solution is to look at kids because kids don't know much about the world. Okay, so they learn from experience. So if they see an object, they go and check it. And an adult would sit and say, oh, I know what this object is, forget about it. But a kid would go there and a kid often take, takes uh, risks in this uh, learning process, you know, because they're not doing any cal uh, calculations about uh, what the risk might involve and what kind of danger might be there and so forth. So they, they are much more innovative in the way they explore the world. They go to the object and touch it and they move it around and they play with it. Uh, and, you know, the advantage of this approach is that you may discover something that you didn't expect. Whereas if you think that you are the expert, that you know everything that you will find based on your past knowledge, and if you pretend to have uh, the image of an adult, you know, uh, where you, you know everything and you, you never show weakness as, as uh, being unfamiliar with something, then you lose the, the edge of, of finding new things, okay, discovering new things. So the remedy to the problems we discussed before is to behave more like kids. You know, when I see adults, very often I, I try to figure out how, what is the kid behind this adult? Because we all pretend to be much more than we actually are. And fundamentally, you know, if you look at what we know and what we don't know about the universe, we are still like classmates in the first day of class. There is so much we don't know, you know, so many scientists got awards just for what you may regard as accounting. You know, they just account for how much dark matter there is in the universe, how much dark energy there is in the universe, but we still don't know what it is. You're just saying, okay, there is, you know, a certain 25% uh, of the cosmic mass budget is dark matter, 5% is ordinary matter, 70% is dark, dark energy. Okay, it sounds very impressive, and a lot of awards and prizes are given to the people who pinpoint the exact uh, accounting, but we still don't know the substance, okay? So there is so much we don't know, and we should be humble. It's a sense of humility. You see, um, the exploration of the unknown is just like spirituality. You know, you are exploring something bigger than you. So you should not put yourself up front. That's what our ego wants to do, to put yourself as the center point. But if you know that you're in a a learning experience, like a kid. If you just say, I don't know much, I just want to figure it out. If that is the attitude, rather than say, I know a lot and I want to portray an image so that I will get more uh, honors and awards and more recognition and so forth. The way adults do their calculations, they portray an image that they know much more than they actually know. If you do that, then you are missing the opportunity of discovering the truth. And a, a kid, on the other hand, admits, you know, the kid doesn't know much and therefore 
you know, the kid takes risks, the, th- the kid admits when things are not clear. So if we adapt that approach to doing science, I think there is uh, the, the, the uh, rate by which we make discoveries will be accelerated. And there is a simple reason for that, that the intellectual climate will not be about demonstrating how smart you are, but will be about demonstrating what what we learn, you know, and 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 it's a different task because you can demonstrate that you are smart by asking a question of how many angels can dance on the tip of a pin. Okay, that sounds like a fascinating question. We don't know if angels exist and whether they dance on the tip of a pin, but you can ask this question. Suppose there are angels and they dance on the tip of a pin, how many can do it? And then you can say, okay, let me generalize this equation in 10 dimensions and do the calculation in 10 dimensions and develop your very sophisticated math. And people say, wow, wow, that's amazing. How was that possible to solve the equations of angels dancing on the tip of a pin in 10 dimensions? That's really exciting. And then they would say, oh yeah, but actually this is not completely, you know, uh, undeserving the fact that we dedicated decades to asking this question because we can use the mathematics to solve that question we can use it in the cont- context of understanding uh, quantum chromodynamics. You know, like the the uh, uh, we can apply it to QCD uh, to to the study of nuclei. Okay, so you develop some mathematics for one question, and you say, "Oh, now I can use that mathematics for another question." Well, I say that's that's legitimate. That's that's good, but that's not the, the work of a physicist. A physicist is supposed to ask questions that have to do with reality, and the way you learn about reality is by experiments and not by intellectual gymnastics. And the reason that you can be engaged just in intellectual gymnastics without any contact with reality is if the motivation to show that you are smart. That If that is the motivation, then you don't care about experiments. And, and that, unfortunately, is much more, more pre- uh, prevalent right now in the theoretical physics community, showing that you are smart and doing mathematical gymnastics. And I say, you know, that's a distraction from the main uh, objective of physics, which is to describe reality. And why is that important to understand reality? Because we live in that reality and we have to adapt to it. Okay. So in order to adapt to reality, we need to understand it. We need to know what environment we live in. You know, we need to know if there is climate change so that we can develop policy for that. We need to know if the earth moves around the sun or the sun moves around the earth in order to develop spaceship that will go into space in the right direction and will move correctly. So all of these, things, if, if we want to cure diseases, if we want to cure the pandemic, you know, the, uh, we need to understand how viruses operate and develop an mRNA vaccine for them. So all of this ha- has to do with us figuring out what reality is and adapting to it. And it's irresponsible of us to pursue a different goal, which is to elevate our ego, to boost our ego, to brag in our intellectual gymnastics, because that may have nothing to do with the reality that we're trying to understand as physicists. Okay, I have many technical questions, So, but let me just briefly get to one comment. So would you be okay then if theoretical physicists change their name from theoretical physicists to pure mathematicians? Oh, or yeah. would there still be a problem? It's purely an, a categorization problem. No problem whatsoever. It's a, you know, if a plumber comes to my home, okay, and says, I'm a plumber, then I would ask the plumber to fix the toilet. Now, suppose the plumber will tell me, no, that's too difficult of a task. I cannot do it. So I would say, okay, can you fix my faucet? You know, it's not working. And the plumber would say, oh, that's also too difficult. Then I would say, you're not a plumber. So I I ask uh, string theorists, I say, okay, you are working on the unification of quantum mechanics and gravity. I have two problems for you just like the toilet and the, and the faucet. One problem is uh, what happened around the Big Bang? Can you tell me? And they say, no, that's too difficult. We can't really solve that problem. So I say, okay, forget about the, the Big Bang. Let's discuss the singularity at the center of a black hole. We know that we need quantum mechanics and gravity for that. Can you solve that problem? And they say, no, it's too difficult. So I say, okay, well, so change your job definition because Unless you solve problems, you cannot call yourself a physicist. Problems about objects in reality, like the Big Bang. We know, you know, that the universe started from a hot, dense phase. 
And if you use Einstein's equations, you get to a singularity. So curing that singularity is a fundamental question that currently we don't have a solution to because, you know, we don't have a quantum theory of gravity. But if string theory is, you should first offer the solution before claiming that you're solving quantum gravity. Okay. And the same about singularities of black holes. So all I'm saying is the job definition matters because people get paid to be plumbers. You see, you can't just say that you're a plumber. Yeah. Okay. I understand. Also, there's this claim that, hey, in pure physics, oh, sorry, not pure physics, in theoretical physics and pure math, that eventually today's abstractions are tomorrow's applied. For example, in string theory, there's plenty of applications to condensed matter physics. However, and that comes about decades later or so. However, I find that to be a dubious claim. And the reason is that if you look at what's applied now, it almost certainly has a theoretical origin. But if you look at the totality of theoretical work, it's not as if all of it's applied. Like I haven't seen an analysis done on string theory. Let's say, let's look at all the string theory papers, how much of it has been applied to condensed matter physics or see even pure mathematics. So it's easy to look back with hindsight and say, oh yes, cryptography, yes, we used combinatorics that we thought would never have any applications from the 1940s and 50s, but then it did. Yeah, okay, yeah, but you have a survivorship bias there. So you can't just fund research no matter what, thinking that hopefully it will have some application because in the past, anything that was applied was theoretical before because you have to look at the other direction too. And I don't right. know of an analysis that's been done. No, so I have no issue whatsoever with pure math. I think that's a very valuable occupation, but you have to define your work as pure math. That That's perfectly fine. And then universities can decide how big the departments of pure math would be. But you can't have people that practice pure math for a century, you know, which is the lifetime of a person uh, in the physics. That, so the question, there is a characteristic time scale. If you do pure math, let's say for a decade or two before it actually is compared to experiments, that, that was the traditional practice of physics. But if you do pure math for the entirety of your career, and then we will never know during your lifetime whether it's relevant to reality or not, I say, you know, it's that's what pure math is all about, that you never know how, to, because even pure pure math in mathema by mathematicians is applied eventually in some context of physics, right? But the way to define pure math is uh, as ideas that are not necessarily applied uh, to the real world and describe the real world during the lifetime of the practitioners, not necessarily. And there are mathematicians that... Uh, invented the mathematical concepts that were applied shortly after they invented them and they were mathematicians okay so the distinction is that physics is engaged with reality through experiments and if there is a subject on which no experimental data comes our way for a very long time there are many other subjects that we can work on it doesn't mean that we should insist working on something that we have no data on uh, perhaps we should wait for that data in the context of quantum gravity it's waiting, for example, for gravitational waves to be detected from the early universe, or learning something about black hole singularities that we didn't know about. But until that data comes along, we have no guidance. And my point is, if we look a hundred years back, quantum mechanics was discovered by experiments. Nobody expected it. Uh, in fact, in around 1900, a very uh, uh, famous, one of the most distinguished uh, uh, experimental physicists, Michelson, uh, who actually did the Michelson-Morley experiment that uh, led to Einstein's special theory of relativity. He uh, gave a speech at the inauguration of a laboratory in Chicago, and he said that uh, from now on, you know, most of physics is solved. That was 1900. Most of physics is solved, and the only thing that remains is measurements of the fundamental constants in physics to the sixth decimal point. And how wrong was he? Because five years later, Albert Einstein came with special theory of relativity that, that revised our notions of space and time, and then general theory of relativity that revised our notion of gravity, and then quantum mechanics, a completely unexpected discovery, okay? That reality is not what we expect from classical physics. Just to show you that without experimental guidance that led to the, the birth of quantum mechanics, we would never be there, okay? And Albert Einstein argued that quantum mechanics uh, perhaps can be interpreted in the same way as classical physics, but he was wrong. 
Niels Bohr was right on this. And uh, now all the gadgets that we use, you know, like these computers that the two of us are using to communicate or cell phones, it's all based on quantum mechanics. So here is applied physics, a whole industry of applied physics that came out from the discovery of quantum mechanics from experiments. And I say, what's the lesson of that? That we, na nature is very subtle. We don't know in advance before experiments what nature is about, okay? And if you don't have guidance by experiments, you may go in the wrong direction. You may go into a dark alley. And to claim that we can come up with a theory of quantum gravity just based on pure thought is arrogant. And in fact, string theory did not come up with very concrete solutions to the Big Bang, to singularities in black holes over five decades. Okay, so I say we took that path. It didn't lead to predictions that can be tested experimentally. And I ask young people, do you want to be engaged in an endeavor that is part of, calls itself part of physics, but does not have any confrontation with reality? I mean, you could spend your life with a notion that is not necessarily used by nature, okay? And there are many other fundamental questions that we can address that have experimental tests. So why not engage in those? You know, there are huge problems that uh, society faces. And at the same time as you see that, you know, that attitude of saying, let's toy with mathematical ideas that you know, that we can do gymnastics, intellectual gymnastics on, at the same time that you have that as part of the mainstream, simply because there wasn't any experimental feedback from, uh, you know, from the superconducting super collider that was envisioned back in the 1980s, but was not funded by Congress. As a result, there was no feedback from experiments. So there was this entire community of theories divorced from experiments. So at the same time that you see that in the mainstream, you see also resistance to study unusual objects that enter the solar system as if they were artificial. Like, this is the most mundane, simple-minded, commonsensical thing. And it's a fraction of the cost as well, compared to how much is spent on theoretical physics each year. Let's get to the, the first goal, which was the Papua New Guinea expedition. Now, let me quickly summarize to see if I have this... Correct. NASA was studying the skies, and the reason they do so is partly military. So they study the sky and they look for, well, they're looking for threats, but they occasionally catch meteorites or meteors. So meteorite is when it hits the ground. A meteor is when it just disintegrates without hitting the ground. Okay. And a meteoroid, I just looked this up, a meteoroid is when it's would have been a meteor, but it's not. It's around the same size, doesn't even hit Earth. Correct? Yeah. Uh, it's basically an object, uh, an object that collides with Earth and burns up in the atmosphere. Yes. Okay, so there were 274 or so of these that were collected across several think, years. Yeah, You looked at some of the data and you saw that the speed of one was greatly different than the speed of the rest and greatly different in that it exceeded the speed of the rest. And now why speed is important is because just like there's an escape velocity of the Earth to get out of Earth's orbit, there's an escape velocity of a solar system, which I never considered before. And so if we're thinking of interstellar, objects, then it would have to be around that speed or greater. Okay, so then what we saw was, or what you saw, was that there was a high-speed meteorite. Okay, great. High-speed meteorite. And that, and the speed matters because it tells you potentially its origin. So that's something that I want to, I kept hearing you bring up speed. I'm like, why the heck does speed matter? Okay, so this is why speed matters. Yeah, because I just think about if you throw um, a rock up in the air, it will fall back because you don't throw it hard enough. But if NASA launches a spacecraft and it moves fast enough, it will escape the pool of the Earth. So speed matters. You need to overcome the, uh, the gravitational potential of the Earth. It's sort of like, imagine a trampoline, okay? And the Earth is at the center of the trampoline, uh, sort of like a, a bowling ball. Uh, you know, it creates uh, a well and... Uh, if you want to throw a marble out of the trampoline, you need to throw it at a high enough speed because otherwise it will fall back. And so there is always an escape speed above which an object will escape from the gravitational potential well of the Earth or of the solar system in the case of the sun. And uh, 
And this object, by the way, wasn't moving just fast enough to escape, uh, but it was moving actually outside of the potential well faster than 95% of all the stars. It was moving at 60 kilometers per second outside the solar system if you extrapolate back in time. So it was really fast. Okay, and just to get some numbers out of the way, approximately 11 kilometers per second is Earth's? Yes. And what is the escape velocity of the solar system? No, the solar system is uh, at the location of the Earth, it's 42 kilometers per second. It's it's always a square root of two times the velocity of a circular orbit around the object that you care about. If you have okay. gravity produced by a single point mass at the center, uh, there is a certain speed by which an object will move in a circular orbit. In the case of the Earth, it's about 30 kilometers per second. And uh, therefore, the escape speed is the speed such that the kinetic energy will equal the potential energy, and that's a square root of 2 faster than the circular speed. And square root of 2 times 30 is about 42 kilometers per second. So that's the speed by which an object would move if it were just to escape from the pool of the sun and came from the vicinity of Earth, okay? But this object was moving even faster than that if you, I mean, it collided with Earth at 45 kilometers per second, but if you take out the motion of the Earth, because it was, it came from the side, so to speak, then it actually moved at 60 kilometers per second outside the solar system. It was really fast. Okay, and then last question before I get to some on Skinwalker and CE5 and unidentified submerged objects and so on. The last question is, okay, so not only was this going extremely quickly, but then when you analyzed well, what's its toughness? It was twice as tough as the second highest rock as well. Okay, so yeah. it has unusual characteristics. Okay, now my question is, how the heck do you find such an object when we can't find Malaysian Airlines hours after, let alone decades later, and it's a larger object, and we had governments involved, and we knew what it looked like and the size and so on. So what does this look like? What does this Papua New Guinea expedition look like? Okay, so the Malaysian airplane did not create a fireball. It did not explode so that satellites or ground-based observatories would see it in the night sky. So all we know about it is that it moved along a certain path, okay? And we don't know at which point along the path it plunged into the water, okay? So then we have a very long path to study on the ocean floor. And the area that you have to explore is huge. So even though the object is bigger than this meteor that we're talking about, the area that you need to explore is much, much larger, okay? And in the case of the meteor, we know where the explosion took place. So we have a, a, a square region that we will study. We also know what the wind speed was at the time of the explosion, uh, what the elevation was, and what the water currents were. So we have a model where we, so we can calculate, depending on the fragment size distribution, we can calculate where the small fragments fell and where the bigger fragments fell. And just, uh, it's just like mowing the lawn, basically uh, scoop uh, the, the thin layer, the top layer of the ocean for any fragments left. And my point is this meteor was really bright and we know precisely, just think about GPS systems. They can localize your car in Boston or in any other city to within a few meters. So imagine you get the GPS coordinates of your car and then it explodes, okay? So you ask yourself, how can I find, you know, like if you only knew that the car moved uh, between New York City and Boston, you know, it will be much tougher to find the car if it, and suppose it didn't explode, it just went off the road somewhere, then you will, it would take you a lot of time to, to find it and you might not find it. But if it exploded and you had, you know, like photographs from satellites of the, you know, the GPS location to within a few meters, it's a piece of cake to find the fragments. So that's the difference. All right, let's get to a question about Jack Vallée. So Jack Vallée, I saw this video and I'll play it for the people who are watching right now. 20 years ago, 
you know, that was a very marginal idea in science. Today, it's not such a marginal idea in science. Mm -hmm. If you look at the Sky and Telescope magazine a year and a half ago, published an article about the creation of universes with multiple dimensions moving at light angle universe. to each other. That's mm -hmm. a very interesting idea. It's a theory. And perhaps the UFO phenomenon is giving us the opportunity to test some of those advanced theories in physics. I think that's why we should look at it. Jacques says that UAPs could potentially be used to test for alternate universes or perhaps dimensions, though I think he says universes. So what's your opinion on this? Okay, so as a physicist, the standard approach you take when you examine experimental data is to say, you know, we have a standard model of physics. It's a, it's a set of rules and equations that were tested many times in many laboratory experiments, okay? And that's what we use for technological development. When we develop a cell phone, we base it on the known laws of physics. You know, no company would say, oh, maybe the uh, quantum mechanics is wrong. Let's develop a cell phone based on some idea about how quantum mechanics may be wrong, or maybe we will build a, a cell phone that operates in other dimensions, or maybe a cell phone that communicates with another universe, you know, no company would survive <laughs> if it were to advocate that it will build a piece of technology based on unknown physics, because it will most of the time, you know, almost always be proven wrong. Like if this company is successful, then they will get the Nobel Prize because they discovered the new law of physics. So the standard approach in doing science or physics is to adapt what is known as the standard model of physics and use it first to interpret any data you get, any experimental evidence. So suppose you include UAP in the unidentified objects. The first approach of the Galileo project in particular would be to, to use the standard laws of, you know, the, the standard model of physics to interpret whatever we see. So we have a set of instruments detecting things we will use the laws of physics as we know them. Now, if we see an object behaving in ways that definitely violate the laws of physics, we will go there. But before we see that, there is no reason. And moreover, I should say, the first thing I would check if I see something moving, let's say, faster than light, just as an example, you see a point of light moving across the sky faster than light, okay? And you can, in principle, infer that. It could be that it's an artifact of the optics because there is some reflection in your detector that moves the point of light faster than light if you think that it's far away, but in fact, it's moving only within the instrument. So, well, you know, and, and it's really difficult. You do a lot of experiments, you don't find deviations. So it's not as if you just see something unusual and you say, okay, the laws of physics are wrong. You can't just do that. That's irresponsible. You have to study the whatever you're studying uh, with the best instruments you have to understand the instruments you know it takes a lot of steps and currently the data on uap is not good enough it's uh, you know many of the images are blurry may, many of them are based on uh you know amateurs taking the data uh and so we really need to go through the scientific process to validate that there is something beyond the standard physics okay uh, Jacques Vallée is mentioning that as a possibility. I say, you know, there are many possibilities. Just like, you know, in the context of string theory, there is a possibility that, you know, string theory is of one type, of another type. And of course, a lot of people can suggest a lot of possibilities. Jacques Vallée may suggest one possibility and then someone else will suggest another. But it doesn't mean that we need to take it seriously until there is data that is validated, that is uh, reproducible, that is based on well-understood uh, suite of instruments that detects it, okay? And so we are not there yet. That's what the Galileo project aims to do. And, and if we find that th there is new physics, of course, that would be extremely exciting because it should apply to the rest of the universe, not just this object. So suppose you find, uh, you know, something completely new that physicists never imagined, then it applies everywhere in the universe. And, and that would be of much more, much broader consequences because you can build new devices based on that. Uh, at that point, te uh, technology development companies in Silicon Valley could build gadgets that make use of this knowledge, okay? So it would be revolutionary, but before we, we claim that we have something revolutionary, we should 
you know, consider the mundane first. There was a paper published last week by Zilyev and, and Petukov and Reshetnik about UAPs in Ukraine. Did you happen to look at this or are you aware of it? Yeah, I actually saw it. And, um, you know, um, uh, obviously Ukraine is currently in a military conflict and um, there are lots of things flying in the sky. Okay. And uh, usually in uh, scientific experiments, we want to minimize the level of noise of spurious things that may be misinterpreted. So if I were to design a place where I would search for unidentified objects, <laughs> Ukraine would be my last choice because uh, there would be so much noise, you know, and, and, and an experiment usually wants to maximize the signal to noise ratio. So um, I, you know, I find it surprising that uh, a paper about unidentified objects would be written from that location because uh, if you wanted to study UAP, it would go to a remote site far away. Okay, speaking of a remote site that may have plenty of signal rather than noise, what about Skinwalker? Have you thought about putting some observatory at Skinwalker? And if not, why not? And what are the criteria that you use to select where to place an observatory? Right. So uh, the first limitation we are facing is the level of funding that we have, because at the moment we have one suite of instruments that uh, cost me about uh, $250,000. And we're testing it right now. And uh, within a few months, hopefully everything will work. And then we will deploy it at the, a site that would allow us to get the useful data and analyze it. So hopefully by the summer of 2023, uh, we'll have uh, uh, data that we can share uh, with the public, the scientists, uh, and that will be peer reviewed in terms of its interpretation. Um, but um, in order for us to build many more systems like it, we need to expand the, the funding level of, of the Galileo project. At the moment, it's only a few million dollars. And uh, in order for us to expand it by a factor of 10, we need a few tens of millions of dollars. So if we do get that, we will be able to place a lot of stations in many locations, including perhaps uh, Skinwalker. I have no, uh, in fact, it would be interesting to see if there is anything unusual there. The only locations that I'm hesitant about are those that may involve sensitive facilities like uh, nuclear plants or military bases simply because of national security issues. So I don't want uh, us to uh, be at risk of uh, violating the law or, uh, or uh, uh, I don't want uh, 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 the intelligence agencies to worry about the, the data that we collect. So I want us to do the job of astronomers. You know, astronomers have observing sites in remote locations, in places that are of no national security risk. And I see this uh, research project as an astronomy project. In fact, uh, the administrators at Harvard uh, asked me, is this part of your day job? Just as I was about to establish the Galileo project, and I thought about it for a few hours, and then I said, yes, it is part of my day job, because in astronomy, we use telescopes to collect data, and there is no lower limit on the distance. You know, we study the sun, we study meteors, we study asteroids, comets. So that's exactly what we do in the Galileo project. We use telescopes, collect data, and interpret it. So it, yes, it is part of my day job. And uh, Harvard University approved of that. And indeed, it's a project embraced by the university. And uh, the other unusual thing about this project is uh, usually you have to work really hard to get funded. And in this case, it was individuals that gave me the money without uh, any fundraising effort on my behalf, which to, to me illustrates the fact that the subject is of great interest to the public. It's of great interest to the government as well. Earlier, you mentioned transmedium. So then I know you're an astronomer, and so you care about the sky. But at some point, do you envision in the future it would look for unidentified submerged objects? Well, uh, if we look um, at the horizon, you know, um, and we are near the ocean, and definitely we will be near the ocean uh, in, in some of our observations, uh, simply because there were a lot of reports on objects near the ocean. 
then we will be able to see if they have anything to do with coming out of the ocean, going back to the ocean or, um, you know, and, and the same is true about the, them coming from outer space. I mean, we know that's what meteors do. Okay. And this meteor that we discussed before, the interstellar meteor, uh, was discovered by uh, missile warning systems that uh, the government employs. It was not necessarily NASA. It was intelligence agencies that are worried about national security. They're monitoring any object entering the sky because they worry about ballistic missiles. And, you know, every now and then they see a rock coming from out there and colliding with Earth. Okay, so that's called a meteor. And most of these rocks belong to the solar system. Uh, There are a thousand times more rocks that belong to the solar system than rocks that come from outside the solar system based on the statistics that uh, we now know about interstellar objects. So, Most of the time, you just see rocks from the solar system. These are leftover rocks from the construction project of planets. You know, that early on in the solar system, there were small rocks that came together to make planets like the Earth. And now some of them are dispersed. They are sort of like Lego pieces that are filling up. And so they hit the Earth every now and then. A big chunk, a big rock hit the Earth, you know, 66 million years ago and killed the dinosaurs. We know that. Uh, The dinosaurs did not have telescopes. uh, And they were not smart enough to worry about the sky. They just ate grass, were happy, and thought that they'd dominate their environment. Well, guess what? They were wiped out because they didn't have telescopes. And we, as a, the human civilization, we are smarter, so we develop telescopes. We can look at near-Earth objects. That's how Oumuamua was discovered. It was identified as a near-Earth object. It was labeled that way. That's why they looked at it. And then they realized, wow, it moves too fast to be bound to the sun. So this was an interstellar object. So uh, what I'm trying to say is the government, uh, you know, monitors the sky. That's their day job. They, they're not doing it for the sake of science. Their day job is to monitor the sky for national security. Every now and then they see a rock entering the atmosphere. And then it turns out that the first interstellar meteor was discovered by those government sensors, you see. And uh, and and uh, My point all along was the government needs to know with very high precision how the object moves because they need to know that if it's a ballistic missile, whether it would hit Boston or Washington, D.C., they need to know that. So what my colleagues were arguing was, oh, the uncertainties in the measurements of the government are very big. And I say, no, they cannot be big. They cannot afford that. That's their day job. And indeed, the government confirmed, took three years for the government to come out with a letter saying indeed this meteor was at the 99.99% from outside the solar system. So I never doubted that the fact that the government has very high precision data. Um, and they find these things anecdotally. You know, if you ask yourself, what's the, you know, what would be the first sign of objects that visit near Earth from outside the solar system or objects that collide with Earth or objects that enter the atmosphere? it's the government that would first identify them because astronomers focus on very distant sources of light and they have narrow fields of view. All the astronomical observatories look at a small portion of the sky from Earth and if a bird flies above the telescope, they just ignore it. So astronomers would be hard-pressed to say, oh, in the survey that I did, I saw an object moving in an unusual way in the Earth's atmosphere. They would just ignore it. They focus on a galaxy at a ratio of five or six. So... Uh, but um, the military has to monitor those things because that's their day job. And the intelligence agencies have. So it's completely natural to expect the government and the intelligence agencies to be the first to say, here are some unusual objects for us to monitor. And that's what UAP are about. That's what the first interstellar meteor is about. And, um, you know, we should just be curious and examine those things. Do you think that the main reason for the government not coming forward with more information on UAPs or at least more high resolution images is because that it gives away their capabilities in terms of sensors? Or is there another reason? Like that's one of the reasons, but there may be a nefarious reason. I don't know. I think that's uh, that's the main reason. That would be my, uh, I don't believe in uh, conspiracies. Um, if I had to guess, I would simply say that they are unsure what the nature of these objects is. So there are two, you know, two general possibilities. Either they are made by 
an adversary with technologies that we never imagined, okay? In which case you want to keep collecting data. You don't want to release what you know. Uh, in the second possibility, you know, it may be of extraterrestrial origin. Uh, and you say to yourself, that's not part of my day job, you know, and I don't want to release the data because it may reveal uh, our abilities to identify objects. Like if it's a high resolution image, then any nation worldwide would know that we can obtain very high resolution images of this of this quality. So you don't you don't show it publicly. OK, so I would say it's more the fact that the government is not a scientific organization. It's not interested in questions that go beyond national security, the safety of military personnel. So if you see an object that doesn't belong to that category, it's not part of your job. Uh, and, and the second is, uh, you know, you don't want to reveal the capabilities you have. And then there is also this, uh, uh, what you mentioned before, there is this stigma uh, in society about discussing uh, such things because uh, it's being ridiculed, okay? And the the data that existed in the past was perhaps not of high enough quality, so people could not really discuss it seriously. But now we have instrumentation that is so good that the government just can't ignore these objects. That's why the subject surfaced in the past five years, I think partly because the instrumentation that gives us the data is of high quality, so the government cannot say, forget about it cannot say, you know, the stigma uh, should uh, um, suppress any discussion on this. And and so the, the subject is, is surfacing up, yet the government cannot release the, the high quality data. So, I, you know, it's just like um, the play by Samuel Beckett. Uh, you could wait for Godot, but you might wait forever. I, I don't believe that the data will be declassified anytime soon. So we better collect our own data, uh, as scientists, and try to analyze it. That's what the Galileo Project is trying. When I think about how would I do the Galileo Project, the main, <laughs> hubrisly, the main problem that I see for analyzing regular UAPs, when I say regular, I mean the ones that are in the popular media, and much of the audience is aware of those types, the Tic Tac types, is that they don't show themselves customarily. It's not repeatable. So how, and I imagine that the third phase, remember we talked about these different pillars. So first was Papua New Guinea, second was the James Webb slash the Chilean Observatory, and the, th the third was the Harvard Observatory. I imagine that the third one is more aligned with the UAPs as we traditionally know them. Okay, so did you choose to place it at Harvard simply because, well, that's what the funding can provide and you're close to it? Or is there some other reason? Oh, no, no. It was just, just for testing the equipment. Uh, that's just a testing phase to make sure that it operates. And then within a few months, we'll put it in a location that is much better. The, the reason we just kept it close to home because we want to make sure that it works uh, uh, to our specifications. Uh, now, I should make a comment because I wrote an essay about it in Medium. By the way, every few days I, I write in Medium, so people who are interested should check it out. Yeah. I don't know how you get the time. You're so prolific. You do so many podcasts, so many news broadcasts. You're a professor. You're a chair on top. You're running the Galileo Project. You do the Medium post. For me to write each day is a laborious, excruciating task, let alone to do what else I have to do. Well, you know, it's uh, what I do all the time. And, and your father. Uh, Jeez. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I should say that it's very rewarding because, uh, for example, uh, uh, just today I was notified that um, the Venice Film Festival will feature um, uh, a competition uh, of 23 projects uh, by... Uh, uh, Film students uh, study uh, um, a film and, and, and basically created uh, works that uh, were inspired by my book about Oumuamua, uh, Extraterrestrial. And uh, that, that book was uh, translated to 25 languages, including Italian. So that's what inspired this competition. And they selected the top three and they would feature them at the Excelsior Hotel in Venice, uh, Italy on the 3rd of September in, uh, uh, this weekend. And uh, they would like to ask me questions about my book and about more. So what I'm trying to say is that there is a huge community out there 
here you have 23 students of film that worked hard to make these projects and competed for the Venice Film Festival. I was not even aware of that. And uh, every day I get a, a, a huge number of emails from people who donate to the Galileo project, who are inspired by. Uh, at the same time, there are, of course, people who uh, ridicule and, uh, you know, just dismiss the work. Uh, but, you know, as long as you have the right idea that uh, to pursue the truth, you know, no prison can confine your passion, so to speak. And, uh, you know, that was the lesson from Nelson Mandela, who uh, for several decades was put in prison, but eventually became the first black president of South Africa. And so you just have to keep uh, dreaming. And as long as your dream is real, it will eventually materialize. And so uh, I... I I feel inspired by the response of people. Now, what I wanted to mention about my essay, uh, it was about the fact that, you know, there are two types of interstellar objects you can imagine, that there are objects that are not functional anymore. For example, imagine New Horizons, the spacecraft that we sent out of the solar system a billion years from now. It will not be functional. It will be just space trash. So you can imagine space trash. And perhaps the meteor that collided with Earth in 2014 was just space trash, okay? Uh, the second type are objects that are functional, perhaps equipped with artificial intelligence, so they have some intelligence, machine learning. If that's the case, for example, if you have an AI astronaut, an AI system that um, is sentient, you know, we are getting close to uh, producing sentient AI systems, perhaps within the coming decade, okay? Uh, so imagine another civilization that had the benefit of, you know, thousands of more years of technology development. So they developed these sentient AI systems and one of them came to visit us or a few of them and they might be self-replicating just like biological systems because they have 3D printers. Anyway, uh, if the UAP, if, if let's say one UAP is of that nature, uh, then dealing with it will not be the same as dealing with a dark matter or dealing with a planet or dealing with a star like the sun. Why? Because all these other things are passive physical objects that do not have intelligence. You know, the, the sun mm -hmm, doesn't mm -hmm. have intelligence, uh, uh, the electron doesn't have. So they do whatever they do. You can design a set of rules or uh, physical laws that you can quantify with equations like quantum mechanics that describe the motion of an electron, that describe the motion of an atom, that describe the motion of a star. Um, but there is no free will associated with a sentient being. There is no consciousness associated with a sentient being. But if you have a sentient AI system, it's a different type of object. It's an object that responds to the way you behave, just like humans respond to the way you behave. So it's just like dealing with humans. So if you think about it, uh, if we were to deal with sentient AI systems that come from another planet, from another civilization, who would be best equipped to deal with them? Would it be physicists? My answer is no, because physicists are used to dealing with passive physical entities. The best professionals to deal with those things would be psychologists. They are used to dealing with sentient systems, humans. And if the, the thing about sentient beings is that they don't always follow what they don't repeat. They, they are not necessarily reproducible. They might do, under the same circumstances, different things. They also digest the data of their encounter with you in a way that will make the next encounter different. And so it's a completely different entity than physical objects that behave always following the laws of physics the same way, and they are predictable, they are reproducible, and so forth. So my point is, if we have the privilege of interacting with sentient AI systems that came from another planet, we have to use a different methodology than traditional physics. And that touches on the point that you brought up. That's extremely, extremely interesting. So how the heck does that work? Would we have to invent a fundamentally different science? 
because like you mentioned, science generally, at least in physics, chemistry, and so on, it's indifferent what we study. Now, of course, there's the observer effect, and but, but that's predictable mathematically, whereas what you're saying is that if it's sentient, maybe large trends would be predictable, though. There might be, but uh, only if... Uh... Uh, it depends how intelligent the system is, you see, because the more intelligent it is, the more complex it is, the more difficult it is for us to forecast what it will do. It would look like free will in a way. And the system will do very different things on different encounters. So um, I call that in my commentary, in my essay on Medium, I call it uh, interstellar psychology. So it's the, <sighs> it's a new field. We're not dealing with humans. You know, humans are difficult uh, to forecast. Um, and that's why psychology is a difficult subject, more, more difficult than physics, I would argue. Uh, and uh, if you deal with the next level, you know, once we develop sentient AI systems, you know, it will become a new subject of, uh, you know, in universities, I think there would be new departments that analyze AI systems because why would we focus only on humans if AI systems are more complex than mm -hmm. humans? We need a whole new uh, area of research that tries to interpret the way AI systems behave. Now, you might say, oh, we, we constructed those AI systems out of hardware, right? We build those computers that behave in this way. Well, we also construct human beings, you know, like we give them birth, right, in the womb. Uh, out of a sperm and an egg, we know the physical constituents that were put together to make a human being. Okay, that's called birth of a human. We see it in hospitals all the time. But that doesn't mean that we understand humans. Psychologists have a hard time understanding, even though we know the material used to make them, mm -hmm. it doesn't mean that we can understand the emergent phenomena. So we give them names. We give the name of free will that, to the fact that we you know, we cannot forecast how a person will behave under some circumstances. We gave this term of consciousness. Uh, so all kinds of emergent phenomena that are at the abstract level, just a signature of complexity of the system that, you know, you can't just start from the atoms that make the system and figure out all these emergent phenomena because it, the system is very complex. I mean, you can do it if you put two atoms together, you can figure out how the molecule will behave. But once you make sufficiently complex molecule even the best computers might not be able to figure out what what it does and and you know building up biological systems is like building a very complex system that we can't really tell what it would do under some circumstances and especially after it's exposed to a lot of experiences so it's not just nature it's also nurture so all of this boils to the point that you know there might be new departments in universities about uh analyzing AI systems in the future once they become sentient. And I can imagine the same with AI systems that came from other civilizations. I want to read a, this is on point, I want to read a quote from your blog. It said, most recently, Congress expanded the definition of UAP to include transmedium objects that are observed to transition between space and atmosphere and bodies of water. An object means it, quote unquote. Whereas a sufficiently advanced AI device could potentially become a U in Bubber's terminology or Boobers. I don't know how to pronounce Boober. that name. Yeah. So if you don't mind, because I, I still have other questions like about CE5 and so on. The audience would love to hear about that. If you don't mind, can you quickly spell out this distinction between it versus you? Yeah. So exactly a century ago, 1923, Martin Buber, a philosopher and theologian, uh, made a distinction between two interactions that humans have. You can have an interaction with an object, okay, like a, a, a cup of tea or a ball. Uh, that's a subject-object interaction. It's an I-it interaction. It's an interaction with an it. Uh, but he also identified another type of interaction with something that goes beyond physical objects, like an interaction with a human being. Or since he was religious, he also included interaction with God. And God represented the eternal you. Uh, but um, even if you are secular, you know, you have interactions with people, if you are a real person, and uh, you know that it's different from an interaction with an object. So Buber uh, made the distinction, and uh, that was the foundation for, uh, you know, 
many aspects of psycho- modern psychology and philosophy and so forth. And uh, he was a, an existentialist, uh, uh, one of the founders of existentialism. And and so his uh, innovation was to dis- distinguish between these two interactions of human. And what I said is that we are used to associating you with humans, but in the future, it could be AI systems that are sufficiently intelligent, that are sentient, and moreover, it could represent our interaction with an extraterrestrial astronaut. Mm-hmm. Now, is this to suggest that the craft themselves may be sentient or conscious? And I'm unsure if you make a distinction between sentience and consciousness, or if you use those interchangeably. No, I. to me, it's just... Um, uh, it, you know, it's the, the definition is similar to the Turing test, okay, in the context of computers. The Turing test that was defined, you know, about 70-something years ago by Alan Turing uh, is, let's let's think about it on a practical level. If you take a lot of people that interact with a computer and they cannot tell the difference between the, uh, the computer being a computer, you put it behind a curtain. Uh, they cannot, by by conversing with that computer, they can't tell the difference between the computer or a person. Then for all practical matters, you know, uh, it's, an, it's, it's an interaction with a you, not with an it. In my definition, I mean, echoing what Buber said. Uh, and so uh, to me, it's all about the practical experience of uh, humans with the system. Now, those things that come from outer space may be far more advanced than any AI system we develop. And so they might be even more sophisticated. They might understand us the way that a biker that goes you know, on the sidewalk understand ants next to, to, it, to the bike. And the ants may think, oh, here is a biker. Let's think about the protocol of how to engage with the biker. But the ants would never realize that the biker cares less about what they do. And the biker is a much more, you know, uh, superior level of intelligence. Um, So it's possible that we would encounter something that is far more superior than us. And it will not be biological because traveling across distances between stars uh, is not something that a biological creature can easily do. I mean, we were selected by natural evolution to survive on this rock that we call Earth. We were not selected to survive the hazardous conditions of space. So so if I had to imagine, I would say the first probes that we will discover that would be sentient would be, you know, made made of uh, electronics, hardware, something else that is not biological because that can survive long journeys. They would have the patience for millions of years to travel. They would not, they could repair themselves um, if hit by cosmic rays or uh, they can adapt to changing physical circumstances much more. They don't need uh, food. They just need energy that they can collect from their interaction with starlight, with with the interstellar medium and so forth. So anyway, uh, my guess is if we find sentient messengers from other civilizations, they would be equipment that is artificial with artificial intelligence, and it may be superior to us. And it will be an interaction with the you. It might even be interaction with what we may regard as a divine entity, because in my way of thinking, uh, a sufficiently advanced scientific civilization is a good approximation to God. It can do magic. It may be able to create life in the laboratory. It may be able to create a baby universe in the laboratory if it understands quantum gravity. So... What we call God in philosophical texts, religious texts, might be represented, the best approximation to it might be a far more advanced scientific gadget compared to what we have right now. When we spoke, I asked you about CE5. You remember? Yeah. Yes. Okay, so did you have a chance to look into that? Uh, Yeah, I did look at that. Um, Why don't you ask your question then? So for those people who don't know, CE5 stands for Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind, and it's reputedly some technique, it's some method of eliciting contact between yourself and a craft or yourself and what's behind the craft, either calling multiple to come or speaking to them telepathically in some way. The stories are that if one performs CE5 and one is trained in it, whatever that means, that one can call 
UFOs or UAPs near them. So then I was wondering, okay, well, that's all anecdotal. This Galileo project sounds like a great way of testing that because you obviously would like UAPs to show up if you could get that repeatedly. That would be great. Okay, so what are your thoughts on CE5 and how the Galileo project may or may not use it? So we get again to the same issue that uh, you brought up in the context of Jacques Vallée. Uh, what is being com contemplated here is a deviation from the standard model of physics. You see, in science or physics, we usually use instruments. We don't use humans as detectors. Why don't we use humans as detectors? Because, you know, humans very often are hallucinating. Uh, they have wishful thinking. Uh, and you cannot always reproduce phenomena with humans, okay? And so, I mean, psychologists study humans, but physicists build instruments that are completely separate from the human experience so that the instruments will collect quantitative data that is reproducible, that we fully understand because we build those instruments, okay? These are measurement devices.